right, if you got your Bibles, James 1 and Genesis 22. This is, this is where we're spending our time today, uh, James 1 and Genesis 22. And we've been talking through this series called Believe. Everybody say Believe. Believe. We've been talking about believing God and going after more and having faith and trust in the Lord. We've been exploring this topic. We're kind of rounding here the, the end of it. Next week will really be the end. But, but today I want to talk about passing the test. Passing the test. How many of y'all are good test takers? A couple of y'all. How many of y'all are not very good at taking tests? You forget more than you learned, right? Anybody else? This is the deal. In our faith, it will be tested. Your faith will be tested. Let me suggest this to you. Anything that is valuable in your life will be tested. And the most valuable thing for the child of God is their faith. It's the most valuable thing is your faith, your trust, your belief in Jesus. And it will be tested tested. It will be tested when you first come to the Lord, and it'll be tested when you're, when you're standing before the Lord. Your faith will be tested. So it's not a question if, it's when. And there will be seasons where you go through that you're tested more than others. Some tests will be more difficult than other tests. I can tell you, I've been, I've been serving the Lord for almost 30 years, and I, I, and I can tell you, some tests have been easy to pass, and some have been really, really hard to pass. And so your faith will be tested in trusting God, and that's really what it is. Faith, faith is a test of trust. That's what it is. It's, it's all it is. Are you going to trust God, or are you going to get back into self-effort? Are you going to get back into self-belief, or are you going to trust God? So trusting God is not always easy, but we are called believers. Believers. Our identity is is found in our faith in him. We are believers. And so it, it, it sounds, things that you're believing God for in the natural should sound unreasonable. We are the people of the impossible. If, if, if what you're believing God for is attainable by your works, you'll get it by your works. But you need to believe God for something that only God can do. This is how we see the miraculous. We are called believers. We believe the impossible. So the impossible is reasonable for us to believe. It's unreasonable for you to believe in things that are possible as a believer. The world's backwards. Well, that's not reasonable. Well, I'm not following a God that's reasonable. I'm following the God of the impossible. So for me, the impossible is reasonable. It makes sense. So the storms, the, the tests that we face are going to come. The wind is going to blow. And we are all at sea. So what we, we can't control if the wind's going to blow or not. But we can't adjust our sails. And if you will adjust your cells, you will not only pass the test, you will get to the next place that you're supposed to be. And I would suggest this, if you get them right, you will accelerate there quickly. And, and let me help you with this, because I, 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 I counsel a lot of folks, talk to a lot of folks, and one of the things that I tell people when they're going through difficult times, where there's difficulty in their marriage, where there's difficulty, they're dealing with doubt, whatever it is, is only control what you can control. That's all you can control. And if you will just get out of the control business, <laughs> of trying to get other people to do what you want to do or the situation to do what you want to do, if you will get out of the control business, you'll be a lot better off mentally. And I think a lot of the stuff that we're focused on, on our culture today with so much, you know, mental health and all this kind of stuff, it's all because we're trying to control everything. This is why faith in Jesus is the fix-all. We're just, we're, we're in the control business. We want to control things. We want to manipulate things. So we lie. We, we do all this stuff. Why? It's so things can go our way. Get out of the control business.
And so only control. Listen, I have found whenever I just focus, just do what only I can do. And sometimes the only thing that I can do is read my Bible and pray. Nothing else is going my way. But you know what? I can control Josh Brown. I can yield Josh Brown. I can't yield you. I can't. I've tried to yield a lot of people. It doesn't work very well. And it's not a control for me, but I'm like, man, you need to be making better decisions. <laughs> you know, get so frustrated. Pastoring, that's why pastoring is so hard. It's because you can't make people do, you can't control people. And so all of our tendencies, all of our tendencies, where you're, whether you're married or you have kids or you don't, or you're trying to get married or you're trying to find something, our whole thing is if I can get them to like me, if I can, it's just if, control. And we don't like the word control because it sounds strong, but we're all trying to do it. Let's get out of the control business. All right, I don't know how we got there, but we landed there, and that's fun. So testing. A lot of it is a test to for you to control it. Are you going to are you going to get your hand in it? <laughs> Come on. Now we know faith of that works is dead. We know that. But it's not about this self-effort, this this carnal flesh thing. So, how many of y'all took tests in school on these things called scantrons? Y'all remember scantrons? Remember these? There's my scantron. That's right. It's a little scantron for you, right? How many of y'all are going back? I remember, I, listen, I remember when scantrons came out. I remember they, they used to have little bubble ones, and then they moved to this mechanism. How many of y'all ever just, you just did the lines, right? You just, you just did B's all the way through it, right? Because you're, you didn't prepare for the test. Oh, we're having a test today? <laughs> Yeah, you were studying like for three weeks. Oh, it's so like in church, we announced something for months, and people were like, what time is it? I'm like, were you not paying attention? It's the same way, same way in school, right? And we just we kind of fill out the bubbles. I, I remember when I was in third grade the first time. <laughs> just kidding. I was just in, it was another grade I was in more than once. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't third grade. <laughs> So the first time I was in third grade and the last time I was in third grade, I, was, I actually had switched to an elementary school. My mom was having some, some, some mental health issues, and, and uh, thank the Lord that, that she got through that. And so we moved into, my, my older brother and I moved into my dad for a short season. I moved into my dad later when I was a teenager, but this is when I was in the third grade. I was just a kid. And uh, we were going to this school. The school was called Ross. And I was really having a hard time because my friends weren't there. And there was, there was a test. And, and we were doing, I think this was before the Scantron days. And we were taking a test. And I went to school and I didn't feel good. And I went to the teacher and I said, hey, I said, I, I don't feel good. And she probably thought, he's trying to get out of the test. I'm sure she thought that. I was in third grade, but I really wasn't feeling good. And so I was like, okay. I was like, well, can I go to the restroom? No, you need to do your test. And so I'm going through the test. And so, and then I get sick in class. And just like all the kids that I've seen do before, I was vomiting on my desk and it got everywhere. It was terrible. It was humiliating. Thank God I didn't have to go back to that school the following year. But I'm, I'm at, I, I just remember it's so gross and I'm so embarrassed and so humiliated and so they, the teacher's apologizing. Oh, I didn't realize you were that sick. And I was like, yeah, I was really sick. I'm, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a liar. And so um, little third grade, third grade daddy. And so um, they send me home. And, you know, I, I was at home for a week or whatever. And then I go back to school. Well, when I went back to school, guess what I had to do? I still had to take the test. It didn't matter because I was ill or unable to take the test, the test was still waiting for me. The test was still there. See, you can skip test day, but when you show back up, the test is going to be there. And most of us, this is the way we approach test. I'll just kind of avoid it, and then it will be gone. But see, the test won't pass. You have to pass the test. And some people think, well, the test will just go away. And can I also tell you this? You need to win some battles. 
and, and you need to pass some tests. And some of you have been taking the same test for 10 years. And you're like, why ain't I growing? Why do I keep dealing with this? Why does this issue keep coming up? Because you won't pass the test. Either you're failing the test or you're avoiding the test. But either way, you've got to go through the test to get to the next level every time. You can try to skip test day. It can, you can have all the legitimate reasons. Maybe all the tests are coming at once. The reasons don't matter. The reality is, is we will all be tested and the test isn't going away. It's going to be there. And some people are studious. They're prepared for tests. Some of us kind of fly by the seat of our, t our pants, right? Rotting faith on there, hoping that will do something. James 1. This is the most ridiculous scripture. You won't find this at Hobby Lobby or a bumper sticker or on shoelaces. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Notice he didn't say you're just going to face one kind of trial. You're going to face, listen, you're going to face all kinds of trials. You're going you're gonna to face trials that will, that will challenge your character. You're going to face trials, trials that will challenge your marriage. None of us get to get out of the test. None of us get to get out of the trials. We, Jesus, Jesus experienced trials. And so if Jesus was sent to the desert, led by the Spirit of God into the desert to be tempted by the devil, if Jesus had to be tested, then don't you think you're going to have to be? I mean, aren't you glad the teachers that were teaching you in school were tested? Because if they weren't tested, you don't want them teaching you. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces. If you got a paper bobble, just circle that word right there. Produces. Faith produces. The testing of your faith produces. We know that faith produces, but also the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking anything. Not lacking anything. Lacking nothing. How does that happen? How do I grow up in God? By going through difficulties. Yeah. Pastor, are you sure we're still in the faith series? <laughs> yeah. No, our faith is going to be tested. Your belief in God is going to be tested. So number one is this. Testing grows us. Testing grows us. You want to grow? Prepare to be tested. Prepare. Know that you're going to be tested. So what do you do? You grow your roots. You learn how to sail. So when the test comes, you're prepared. Do your homework. Study the word. What did Jesus use when he was tested? The word. Well, if Jesus used, if it was good enough for Jesus to use the word when he's tested, it's good enough for me. He didn't even, Jesus didn't even use Jesus to to get through the test, he used the words. There's a parable in Mark chapter 4 that talks about my, really my favorite parable where there's seeds out and it's all scattered and, it's, and the seed's producing. And it talks about how the, that one of the seeds grows up, but because it has no root, the sun comes out, which is required for that to grow. When the sun comes out, it shrivels up and dies. Well, what is the sun? And Jesus says it. He says the sun is the trials. It's the photosynthesis. It's what's supposed to grow you. But if you're not well-rooted, it will destroy you. So you got to prepare for the test because testing grows you. You want to have fruit? You don't wake up one day and be fruitful. 
You don't wake up going, oh, I'm just so patient. I, I prayed a prayer at church. We had an awesome service. So I'm all, I'm all of a sudden so patient. <laughs> I remember we had a, uh, when we lived in El Paso, Le- Leslie, Pastor Leslie watched uh, our nieces and nephews. And so one day she had to go do some things. And she said, I, I need you to watch the kids. Five kids under the age of four. This is not really my sweet spot. And I'm telling the Lord, Lord, I don't want to learn anything today. Right? Have you ever been there? Right? But I, I did. I learned some things. And it wasn't, wasn't pleasurable. But I grew a little bit in my patience. Still got a long way to go. And so there's, there's more tests coming. But I'm growing in my patience. The second thing about testing is this. Testing is a revealer. It shows you where your faith is, and it shows you where your faith is going. So consider it joy. Man, this is hard. It's difficult. But you know what? God's refining me. I'm not going through this because God's mad at me or frustrated at me or disappointed at me. God's growing me. And so I can consider it joy when it's difficult. I can go, man, it doesn't feel good. It hurts, you know. And rather than just complaining about it, I just go, Lord, it's hard. I'm just going to lean in a little harder. He's like, yeah, that's what I want. And then I'm growing, and I can consider it joy because I know that, that I'm growing. But it shows us where faith has grown. Uh, listen, testing does this. It shows you where your heart is. You, you say something. Listen, if you have a filthy mouth every time something comes up, that's what's in your heart. Jesus teaches this. This. So that test, even though it might not be a season, that moment is a test to show you where your faith is. Right? If you get angry and you throw a fit or, or you, you get, get bitter, I, I've seen this with people, they get, like someone offends them and they get bitter. What is the offense? The offense, you can sit there and talk about the offense all day long. Right or wrong, here or there, it doesn't matter. What is your response? That's a test to see, are you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Yes, yes, I am, but I'm struggling with this. And then what you see is 10 years later, the same thing happens, and it doesn't bother you anymore because you've grown. But if you keep failing the test, you won't grow. And so the Lord wants you to grow. You okay? And this is, this is the truth right here. There's only one who grades the test. But everybody's watching. And it matters. It's just me and Jesus. It's not. It's not just you and Jesus. That's the most ridiculous, unbiblical thing that people say. It's just me and Jesus. No, it's not. You're setting an example, a tone for the world that you live in. You're representing the body of Christ. You know why the body of Christ has such a bad reputation? Because people failed the test. People are watching. God's doing, God, listen, God is grading the test. But people are watching. And we need to be graceful when when we're being tested. So testing is a revealer. Testing grows us. In testing, the devil tempts us. Right? So that's when temptation happens. How many of you have ever gone through, you, like you've gone like a couple of weeks and you're like, man, I wasn't even tempted one time. Has that ever happened? But then you go through another week and you're like, dang, it's like everywhere. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm just going to stay at home in bed. It's so difficult. And what, one of the temptations that, that, that we have is because is, the devil's such a deceiver is, is we go through this, the, the temptation of blaming God for the temptation. God, why are you making me go through this? God, why, why I've heard, actually heard Christians, well-seasoned Christians say, God's tempting me. No, no, no. God can't tempt you. The devil is the tempter. God is testing. He's watching. He's watching. Let's see how they're going to handle the temptation. 
James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt you. That's the devil. So don't, don't, don't buy into the temptation to, to, to blame God for it. Remember, this is what happened in the garden. Right? God shows up. Adam and Eve, they blew it. Right? And it all starts with the devil going, hey, surely what God said wasn't true. Surely you won't die. What is it? It's temptation to not believe the Lord. He's afraid you'll be like God. They were already like God. Remember, they were made in his image. They had no sin in them. Remember the desert? Jesus in the desert? If you're the son of God. Always questioning our identity. Always questioning what the Lord says. Always. It's always the temptation. The temptation is always to get you to believe something about God that isn't true. Or something about yourself that isn't true. So the devil desires to disengage you from your community and your connection in Jesus. He desires to disappoint your desires. He desires to discourage you and rob you of hope. He desires to distract you from your purpose. He desires to disrupt the refining process. And he desires to dismantle your identity. This is the assignment of the devil, to destroy you. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life. Will you believe the lies? Or will you believe what God says? Will you get back into works and self-effort? Will you believe God or will you move back into fear, doubt, and unbelief? Will you believe God? And the enemy is always trying to get us to question and doubt what God has spoken, whether it's about us or what was in his word about what is true. So in testing, the devil tempts us. Number four, testing proves us. Testing grows us. Testing is a revealer. In testing, the devil tempts us. And number four, testing proves us. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive, oh, here it is, the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I, uh, I shared this at the furnace the other day. I watched this mock Bickle reel on Instagram, and it wrecked me. And uh, Leslie was in the post office, and I was just kind of scrolling as I was sitting in the car, and I saw this reel, and I'm, like, getting all, like, jacked up in the parking lot of the post office. As Mike Bickle shares this, this illustration. He says, imagine it's judgment day, and you're there before the Lord. And there's the whole company of angels and those that have gone before you, the race, and there you are. It's your turn. When you walk in the room, the Lord points at you. And he says, there he is. That's the one who loves me. That's the one who loved me well. That's the one that's been faithful. There he is. There she is. And the, 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 the crowd, all of heaven is applauding. There they are. They ran the race. They loved me well. This, listen, beloved, this is what we're coming into to receive this crown, not, not some big glorious mansion. No, no, no. The crown is the Lord to look at us and go, you did well. You passed the test. You loved me well. You were desiring me. It was hard. I saw you struggling. They loved me well. He's looking around heaven and he's going, look how hard they fought to serve me, to trust me, to be here today. Look, look how much they wanted me. They loved me well. This is what it says right here. They will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want to love him well. Man, that, that video inspired me so much. I was like, man, I want to love the Lord. I want to love the Lord more. I just want to love him so deeply. And, and how many of you know that when you, you are in love with someone, it's, it, it turns duty into delight? It's, it's, cha it's a game changer, beloved. Get into the love of God. 
get into the love of God. So a faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. So in this series, we've been talking about belief. We've been talking about faith. And we haven't talked much about Abraham. We've mentioned him. But I want, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Abraham because Abraham is what we call the father of faith. This is what Scripture refers to him as. And so Abraham, if you don't know this, Abraham was didn't have any kids. He's old. And God comes to him and he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. In other words, I'm going to build a people group from your loins. And I'm going to populate the earth through you. And he's really talking about the Jewish people. And so he's like, it, the, the, the earth is going to be full of, and, he, and he's speaking genetically of the Jewish people. He's speaking prophetically of those that are in Christ. And so he says, I'm going to, I'm going to produce this. So he's old. He's like an old man. Way, way, past, way past his good years. Way past his 20s. I mean, him and his wife are not very active. And she's old. Like old. Like 70s. And God's like, hey, I'm going to populate the earth with you. Imagine, you're barren. And the Lord comes to you and says that. Well, that's a miracle. Can you imagine? They're out at the well one day. Sarah's at the well one day, and she's like, guess what? We heard the Lord. And I know we're old and everything, but he said he's going he's gonna to populate the planet with us. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Maybe you need to go to church somewhere else, you know. I mean, it's like the whole thing. So what are they going to do? Are they going to believe God? It doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable. So God promises him 70, 75 years old. His wife laughs about it, actually. She's not convinced. And so at about 100 years old, after like 25 years of this promise, she gets pregnant. She's like a 100-year-old pregnant woman. <laughs> it's crazy. Well past her prime. So the son is born, Isaac, and God comes to Isaac, and this is what he says. Now, come on, that's... That is a promise baked into a trial. <laughs> I mean, who's going to believe God? Yeah. But Abraham was a friend of God. He knew God's voice well. And so it says this, this sometime later, <laughs> like 25 years later, right? Or like 25 minutes later, sometime. That's sometime in my, in my book, 25 minutes is sometime later. Or maybe 25 days, but not 25 years. God tested Abraham's faith. Oh, <laughs> I mean, wasn't that already, like, baked into the promise? Yeah, well, here we go again. Abraham, God says, Abraham. Abraham, actually, the name means father of many nations. And God called him, and he said, yes, here I am. And he says, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. And this is what it says, the next morning. Whoa, <laughs> that's not me. Can we plan this out a little bit, Lord? I mean, here we are like 25 later, so I'm going to give you some time. <laughs> the next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for the fire and a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. 
whoa. God is asking him to sacrifice Isaac, and Abraham's saying, okay, the next morning. Why? Why would he do it the next morning? Because Abraham had history with God. And see, history with, listen, bad history makes you hopeless, but good history makes you hopeful. And the thing is, is some of you, you just have bad history with God. That's why you don't carry any hope. And it's not because God hasn't been faithful. It's because you haven't been faithful. But Abraham had been faithful, and he's faithful right here to get up the next morning. So what do we do to pass the test? Hope up. Don't keep your hopes low. I'm, I'm here to tell you, get your hopes up. Be like Abraham. When God tells you something, immediately respond to it the next morning. 100-year-old man, the next morning, grab him his probably teenager son or older than that. When they get a little bigger, they're not as easy to take out. <laughs> but you can take them out, at least for a while. Posture up, hope up. Listen, God's promise is always greater than the current reality. God's promise is always greater than reality. It's always the greater reality. God's promise. God's promise is as it is in heaven on the earth. On the earth as it is in heaven. What is the greater? To the doctor's report. Healing. What is the greater reality to lack in my bank account? Provision. What is the greater reality to my depression? Hope and joy. The greater reality. See, there's a difference between desire and hope. We use the word hope in exchange for desire. We say, I hope this happens. In other words, I would like for this to happen. That's not what hope means. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is in him. A desire is what I would like to happen. Hope is in him and his promise. I have hope in Jesus. And when I put hope in him, I will not be disappointed because I'm not putting hope in me. I'm not putting hope in an outcome. I'm putting hope in him. Those who hope in him will not be disappointed. I'm not putting anything, hope in anything other, other than Christ, who is the hope of glory. Christ is the hope. And he gives us hope. 1 Peter 1.3, it is by his great mercy that we've been born again. Because God raised Christ from the dead. Now we live because of that. Because of that, now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. Every day, you have something good to wake up to. Every day, you can have hope because you have a priceless inheritance. And you, and you start living off that inheritance now. You don't have, the good thing about it in the kingdom is that you live off here. You don't have to wait to die to, for someone to receive it. Jesus already died. Now we receive it. The life is now and later. We get rewards then, but we also get reward now. And this is Abraham. He had experienced incredible reward. So hope up. When you're going through difficulties, keep your hopes up. Keep your head up. Keep your posture up. Be confident in God. Be confident in his word. Develop some history. If you're not there yet, just pass some tests. Eventually you'll have some, some, some hope, some holy optimism to carry you through. through. Hope up. The next morning. Just obey the Lord. The test will be to put God on pause. But the, the test will be there again if you do that. On the third day, verse 4, of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the, a place, the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. 
What is wrong with Abraham? Didn't, did he not just hear that God told him to give him his son and then he's telling his servants, we're gonna come back? He's not talking about his servants. They're staying there. He's talking about him and his boy. We're gonna go worship and we're gonna come back. We are. What is that? That's the hope talking. So Abraham placed the wood for burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. <laughs> so a good dad here right there. Come on, you carry it. <laughs> While he himself carried the fire and the knife, as the two of them were walking together, Isaac turned to his father and he said, Dad, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied. He said, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the sheep? For the burnt offering. Get a little nervous here, Dad. Where God's asked you to do some pretty crazy stuff. I'm not seeing a sacrificial lamb anywhere. If it was me, I think I would have winked. I would have been like, <laughs> We're going to come back. <laughs> like something about to happen. God will provide. <laughs> I'm providing you. He's not saying that. He's thinking I'm providing you, but God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham said, and they walked on together. Listen, if you want to pass the test, you got to have hope up, but then you got to speak up. You've got to speak up about the promises of God. We will return. God will provide. Yes. And this is where you've got to get, beloved. Sometimes the test is in your mouth. What will you say? Will you get into worry? I don't know, man. I don't know if, I don't know if God will take care of us this time. I don't know. Don't keep your hopes up too high. No, no, no. We're coming back. And God will provide. Speak up. When you're going through difficulty, don't speak down. Don't talk about how difficult it is, how, how much you're struggling. Well, you just don't know if you can handle another thing. No, no, no. And listen, beloved, I know it's hard. It's a test. It's not supposed to be easy. But sometimes when you're going through it, you just got to speak up. You got to speak your hope. You got you to gotta say stuff and remember the word of God. This is why we have the word. Jesus said this. Take heart. In this world, you're going to face trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. These, these scriptures are all in your notes there. 1 John 5, 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Guess what? You're an overcomer because you believe in Jesus. Romans 8, what, what I like to call the victory discourse. says so stuff like this. Who, who can separate us from the love of God? Can trials, can difficulties... Can temptations, can anything separate us from the love of God? No, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not famine, not nakedness, not danger, not sword. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. If God is for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors. We're not just getting by. We are more than conquerors. We are hyper-victorious. All we do is win. That's all we do. You declare, get that word in your belly and then get it on your tongue. Speak up. Hope up. Speak up. And then they arrived to the place where God told him to go. And Abraham built an altar, arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Can you imagine this? And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice at that moment. At that moment. Can I tell you today that it was never God's intention for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. It was God's intention for Abraham to sacrifice Abraham. What was God testing? God was testing Abraham's obedience. Will you obey? 
Abraham, Abraham. Finally, I'm hearing the voice of the Lord. When he says that neighbor Abraham, was he saying, listen, this is the covenant name that God had given Abram. His name used to be Abram, but when he promised him he'd be the father of many nations, he changed his name to Abraham. So when God calls him Abraham, Abraham, he's like, hold up. Remember, your name is Abraham. We're in covenant together. I've got you. I've got you, beloved child of God. I've got you. Yes, here I am. Not here he is, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Don't hurt him in any way, for I know that you truly fear God, and you have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up. See, hope up. Speak up. And look up. Abraham looks up and he sees a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he, and the, he, he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering. We will go, we will worship there, and we will return. In place of his son, and Abraham named the place Yahweh Yara or Jehovah Jireh, which means this, the Lord will provide. And he knew the whole time that God would provide because he had seen God provide time after time after time again. And it was was possible for him to obey what seemed to be impossible because he hoped up, he spoke up, and he looked up. What are we looking to? We're looking to the provision of God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. My hope is up because he is faithful. I'm not always faithful. But he's always faithful. I'm not always a good boy, but he's always a good God. I don't always make good decisions, but he always does. I put my hope in him. I had this moment in the counselor's office in 2016. And I was just like, I just need some courage. <laughs> just need someone to encourage me. And my doctor at the time looked at me and he said, Josh, he says, you just got to eat the bread that the Lord provides. And he's like, sometimes it's bread that you might not prefer, but it's what the Lord provides. Well, I'm not looking at the bread. I'm looking that it's provided. I'm looking to him. I'm looking at the provision. We look up. What are we looking at? We're looking at the provision. Did you know this? Jesus is the provision. He's the provision. What can knock away the shame and the sin and the guilt? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the only thing that will deal with the human issue, the brokenness. It's all in Jesus. Jesus is God's provision. Thank you so much for joining us at church today. Please subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for future notifications. We pray that you have a blessed week and we can't wait to encounter Jesus with you online.